You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. I think of him sometimes in terms of the TV character Columbo, who, <laughs> who seemed bumbling at first, and until he'd figured out what it was that he wanted to ask, and then he pinned it down. And Henry had this, started slow until he got a sense of the audience and, and the listeners, and then, uh, and then there was a point where he would prop his glasses up on his forehead, and his friends would refer to this as the war cant. And all of a sudden, he would go from just ordinary discourse to transcendent oratory. And it was apparently really something amazing to experience. This Pride, everyone's coming through for the Trevor Project on YouTube Shorts. Join us! Create a short showing how you're stepping up for Pride using the hashtag YouTube Pride Challenge. Come through for Pride on YouTube Shorts. Visit youtube.com backslash pride. John Kukla has directed research and publishing at the Library of Virginia and directed the historic New Orleans Collection and the Red Hill, the Patrick Henry National Memorial in Charlotte County, Virginia. He is the author of Mr. Jefferson's Women and A Wilderness So Immense, The Louisiana Purchase, and The Destiny of America, as well as many scholarly articles and reviews. He has held research fellowships in the British Museum, the Virginia Historical Society, and the International Center for Jefferson Studies at Monticello, and has been a distinguished lecturer for the Organization of American Historians. He is here to discuss his book, Patrick Henry, Champion of Liberty. John, thanks for coming on the podcast. Delighted to be here. We hear about Patrick Henry in learning about history, but so often it's about the one speech, give me liberty or give me death. But your book reveals how he was as much a revolutionary as anybody in Massachusetts, and he was kind of the Sam Adams of Virginia. Talk a bit about his other contributions. Sure. Well, one of the things that makes Henry unusual, I suppose, for his, even for his generation, is the fact that he was involved in so much of the era of the revolution. You know, he first came on the scene in the Parsons cause uh, in 1763. That particular legal thing uh, dealt with some of the same constitutional issues of uh, the relationship between the colonies and, uh, and the authority of Parliament and the king that then uh, arose in the Stamp Act. Uh, in 1765 with the Stamp Act crisis, and then arguably uh, uh, the the issues, the constitutional issues defined in the Stamp Act crisis were pretty much the same ones that were uh, fought over in the War for Independence starting in 76. And then Henry continued to be involved in, in politics through the 1790s. So he was, he was very much involved in the early years of the movement toward a strengthened Continental Congress that then ultimately becomes the movement toward writing and ratifying a new constitution. He was uh, opposed to the ratification of the constitution, wanted a, he was a little bit fearful about the transfer of what he thought was too much power to the federal government, and also the need for a better definition of American liberties, which ultimately leads to the Bill of Rights. He retires from active politics in Virginia in the very early 1790s, but is even spoken about as a presidential candidate. And then finally, he, you know, he departs the scene at the age of 63 when he dies in June of, uh, of, of 1799. So for 30 some years, he's, uh, he's active in um, political life during that entire era of the American Revolution. Let's talk a bit about that beginning because that Parsons cause is interesting. If I have it right, I could have it wrong. If the, the Parsons actually went to Britain to get their justice over what they didn't like a decision that was made by the Virginia government. Yeah. And in doing so, set up a, an early battle in the 1760s, uh, British versus Virginia power and authority. That's exactly right. They took exception to uh, a, a temporary law that had been passed by the Virginia legislature, a fairly complex legal and, uh, and, and economic situation. But basically, it was a temporary law uh, designed to ease the, uh, the effects of bad crops on the, on the taxpayers. Um, and uh, with an eye towards fairness, uh, as, as the legislature saw it, the, um, 
the Parsons saw themselves as uh, lose, losing out on what should have been a, a windfall in their um, in the payment of their salaries, and uh, and rather than part protesting it in the legislature in Virginia when the law was being enacted, uh, there were a couple of these guys who uh, who basically wanted to assert greater church authority, bishop's authority, and and ultimately royal authority. Uh, in the life of the church in Virginia, and so they took it to the Bishop of London, who had responsibility for the colonies, and uh, and he in turn was able to get the uh, uh, authorities in England to uh, to overrule the law. So, what so what happens in 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 the Parsons' cause? A series of of uh, legal cases in which the Parsons are suing suing their vestries or church councils for back pay is that uh, Henry makes the arguments that a number of the legislators in Virginia did that. Uh, that basically this was an area in which the Virginia legislature was predominant and that uh, it shouldn't be subject to being overruled or uh, you know modified by parliament and the crown the the timing is such that these arguments over the governance of the church in Virginia um play immediately into the announcement by the Grenville administration that they're going to impose a stamp ta- stamp tax on the colonies the issues have been in a sense, well rehearsed in the Virginia political system, and it's part of the reason that uh, you know that these wealthy ch- slaveholding planters uh, suddenly sound like a bunch of boss radicals. Talk about how persuasive Patrick Henry was. One of the impediments to writing about Henry, of course, is that um, his oratory was a big part of his. Uh, uh, his political career, obviously, and you know, there's no tape recordings, there's no video. There's uh, right. uh, it, oftentimes there's uh, that that to the extent that we have a transcript of what was said, it's um, it's one that was reconstructed by people who, uh, who who heard him and and tried to put down on paper what what he had said. But uh, but what we do have is the reactions of listeners. Henry had been influenced early in his life by one of the evangelical uh, preachers of the Great Awakening, a man named uh, Samuel Davies, who later, he, he was a Hanover evangelical, um, and then later uh, ends his career as president of what's now Princeton University. Um, but So Henry learned from Davies, who was just a generation later than, uh, uh, than Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield, uh, learned the sort of rhetorical style of the evangelical preachers, and then brought to it the uh, political output outlook of the uh, basically of the Virginia uh, and the, and the colonial leaders, and it made for a, a very very powerful uh, thing. One of the ironies I think that that I discovered in writing about Henry and his oratory is that um, it's perhaps not his speaking ability that um, that that made him so effective. It's rather his uh, apparently a very very unusual ability to to read an audience to uh to engage in conversation in short to listen and to figure out what you know what his hearer his listener whether it's in a conversation or whether it's in a courtroom or in a jury or a legislator a legislature uh to to kind of figure out where they are and how he can how he can connect to them in a persuasive way. And I think of him sometimes in terms of the TV character Columbo, who, <laughs> who seemed bumbling at first, and until he'd figured out what it was that he wanted to ask, and then he pinned it down. And Henry had this started slow until he got a sense of the audience and, and the listeners. And then, uh, and then there was a point, uh, as, as his followers or his uh, people who wrote about this uh, say, there was a point where he would uh, prop his glasses up on his forehead, and his friends recurred, referred to this as the war cant. And all of a sudden, he would go from just ordinary discourse to transcendent oratory, and it was apparently really something amazing to experience. And uh, as a result of this, we see Patrick Henry as a, as a significant leader, he's really commanding the militant forces of the Patriots in the Virginia area against the then governor right. and uh, also becomes a state governor several times. Yeah, he serves, he serves the first three years as the uh, first uh, elected governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia from 76 to uh, 79, and they had uh, one-year terms and a, and a three-year term limit in the Constitution. 
so he comes back uh, after the um, after the wars ended. He comes back for two more years in the uh, 1785 and six and seven uh, as as governor. So he serves a a total of five terms as uh, as as governor, and then almost 30 years in the legislature, all told, between the colonial and the and the uh, uh, independent uh, uh, legislature of the, of the state. Some people uh, remember him, or in some accounts, they say he's a he was a tavern keep. But uh, is that really true? First of all, we should define tavern in terms of uh, of uh, 18th century uh, Virginia and also uh, English practice. Uh, basically, what they were is they were um, hotels. Uh, they were the ordinaries. They were the place that if you were traveling, you you could get a room, you could get a meal, you could have your horse, uh, uh, you know, bedded and fed, and you could also get a drink. Henry's father-in-law ran what's uh, what's now known as Hanover Ca- Tavern, uh, which is uh, then 100, 100 yards of Hanover Courthouse in the at the courthouse of Hanover County, um, and um, it was there that he he was living at the time that he um, read law and ultimately passed the bar and. Uh, Oh, there are arguments that go on among his uh, among his descenders and his detractors as to uh, whether or not he was just a common bartender, as some of them would have it, or whether he uh, helped uh, helped his helped his father run the place, which is uh, or father-in-law rather, which is probably closer uh, closer to the truth. But to say that he was a tavern keeper um, um, in uh, in the sense of uh, just slinging drinks. Uh, would would be to misunderstand the, the 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 nature of an 18th century tavern, which was a little bit more like a hotel or a bed and breakfast. And there are some accounts that he was uh, backwoods, but Hanover County really not backwoods per se at this time. That's right. It 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 was definitely um, it was a, a very prosperous place. Um, Hanover is one of those counties in Virginia that uh, uh, that unwisely sent its records to Richmond. For safekeeping during the Civil War, and the building in which they were kept went up at the end of the it went up in flames at the end of the uh, at the end of the at the fall of Richmond at the end of the war. So uh, so we don't have quite the documentation we'd like to. But essentially, Hanover is uh, on the western um, tributaries of the York River, and uh, essentially there was a there was a lot of movement of really wealthy um, uh, families and their descendants who who went west along the uh, along the line of those rivers uh, which parallel to the to the south uh, you've got the James River Valley uh, sim- inviting a similar kind of western movement and Hanover was a bustling place um, in the uh, in the 18th century and in fact at one point um, there was talk in the legislature of uh, moving the capital from Williamsburg uh, which is on the peninsula between the York and the James, uh, moving it actually to uh, Hanover, some 60 miles uh, north and west. And uh, he's very involved, a significant figure. And the fact that he's been somewhat lost to history, again, everyone knows the name Patrick Henry because of the famous speech, but you would almost think for many that he was just a person that gave one speech and then Jefferson and Washington uh, took over from there, Mm -hmm. but really not so. Uh, He was a governor. He, if if I'm correct, some of the issues that he would advocate, and he's a very strong supporter of education, mm-hmm. uh, freedom of religion. Very much so. Obviously, the patriot cause. He seemed to also have a bit more of a belief in the strength of executive power, even within a, a Republican government, as strong as a Republican he was. Yeah. Uh, he he wanted the state of Virginia, which he had a role in in crafting. He wanted that state to have a stronger governor than what it got. That's that that's true. And in some ways, his uh, his concern, which he expressed in the writing of the uh, Constitution, the first first uh, uh, Constitution of Virginia in 1776, uh, his concern to to have a strong governorship was in in part the wisdom of that was proven when the when the uh, British uh, invaded Virginia at the uh, in 1780 and 81 at the end of the war, um, and it was difficult for the executive branch to respond to uh, to those measures given the uh, limits that had been placed on its on its power. 
Henry was, you know, Henry was really prepared to, when he was in, in office, he was prepared to exert the powers of his, uh, of, of his office um, for what he thought was the good of the, the population and the, and the Commonwealth. Um, and I think it's kind of interesting, for example, on, uh, he often gets dragged into debates on, uh, on the relative strengths of state versus uh, federal authority. And uh, I think it's really quite clear that although Henry was jealous of uh, letting authority be transferred from from the state to uh, to Congress, just as he had been uh, jealous of uh, and, and and suspicious of uh, Parliament and the and the King. Um, this is not a. There's no animus toward government itself. Um, and I think he recognized that one of the ways to have effective government and to defend. Uh, defend uh, one's liberties and stuff was to have a government that was close and 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 honest and uh, well run and um, um, try to do things at the he saw it as at the at the state level to the extent that one can um, and 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 in some ways in the 18th century uh, the state government protected the counties. I mean Virginia was an enormous state at that time. It was uh, it, it it was a huge state uh, up until the point where it. Uh, Seeded its uh, essentially it it laid claim to the Ohio Valley um, and uh, in at the toward the end of the uh, uh, revolution it uh, offered to give up um, its claim to the uh, to the seven states that uh, that comprised what was then called the Old Northwest reaching all the way up to uh, Wisconsin and Minnesota um, it it ceded those cl- those land claims to uh, to Congress um, in exchange for the other states giving up all of their claims uh, uh, as well. He was a good friend and supporter of George Washington, also of Virginia, and he had a role much uncelebrated, but you reveal it in, in your book, of protecting Washington's place as general of the Continental Armies uh, during, the, uh, during what's known as the Conway Cabal. Uh, yeah, could you talk about that a bit? Yeah, it's a it's a it's a little known story. Uh, what, frankly, Henry's and Washington's relationship is is something that people don't comprehend mm-hmm. uh, or appreciate because uh, uh, one of the things that Henry did, although most of the first three years of the war was being fought in the North, uh, Virginia sent food and and recruits and uh, uh, ammunition and uh, um, you know all kinds of. Uh, uh, materiel to support Washington and his army, and with with Henry in the in the governor's chair, um, Henry did a lot of that uh, work with Washington, and so they really forged a working relationship um, during the early years of the war. And then, as it happens, Henry was governor when uh, when a a letter came to him from somewhere uh, in in North. It was a it was an unsigned letter. Uh, this was a practice that some of the um, uh, some of the patriots had uh, had undertaken because they didn't want to risk their correspondence being pu- uh, captured by the British and published in embarrassing ways in the newspapers and stuff. So they would they would leave a letter unsigned um, with the expectation that the recipient would would recognize the handwriting. In this case, uh, Benjamin Rush wrote from uh, the Philadelphia um, um, revolutionary um, wrote from um, from the North to Henry. Basically, um, advocating uh, advocating Washington's retirement as uh, uh, as uh, the commander in chief of the uh, American armies um, and his replacement by Horatio Gates. Uh, at this particular moment, Washington's um, forces were kind of bogged down in protecting uh, in in Pennsylvania, and New York, and. Um, uh, and, it, and the contrast with Gates, who had just uh, uh, accepted um, Burgoyne's surrender at Saratoga uh, in 1778 and, and, and thereby brought the French in as an old formal ally and so on, the contrast between Washington's seeming failures and Gates' uh, lustrous uh, success had led uh, a group of people around Washington, uh, and notably the General Conway, to, uh, to, to start agitating for Washington's uh, uh, replacement to make a, a a complex story very 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 brief. What happens is that Henry gets this letter, sees it. Um, Rush thought that Henry would join in, um, you know, to to uh, uh, overthrow uh, Washington. Uh, instead, Henry uh, writes 
to Washington and says, you know, that somebody sent me this letter. I don't know who it came from, but you should know about it. Uh, Washington did, did recognize who it was and essentially scotched the whole thing. Um, but what's, uh, what, what, what perhaps is of lasting importance is that uh, Washington, to in, into the last year of their respective lives, so Henry died in June and Washington uh, in December of 1799, into the last year of their lives, Washington was still referring to this act of, of, uh, of support and, uh, and, and friendship on behalf of Henry um, and uh, never, never, ever lost his faith in Henry's uh, inherent uh, commitment to the good of America, even though the two of them uh, could, could not have been further apart on the question of whether or not to uh, ratify the, the new Constitution. Now, Washington certainly didn't hold a grudge in that way. Uh, if someone didn't didn't attack him personally, differences on the Constitution were were something he was well aware of, and in fact, probably sought out to persuade those people uh, more than more than the ones that agreed with them. And he he wanted mm-hmm. to get closer with them, the Richard Henry Lee or the or the Patrick Henry. Uh, but but indeed, Patrick Henry. Um, well, let's start with that. I think I think I want to hammer down on that point a bit because I think it's so significant that his sure. role in the Conway Cabal might have saved Washington's tenure as general, and it would be somewhat uh, speculation to 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 consider what that might have done to the war. It's hard to tell. The generalship was you know such a large war and such a moving many moving pieces. But sure. um, it's possible that would have had an impact in the war. Certainly in the American Civil War, the changing of generals all the time was uh, for politics was something that uh, w- might have hurt, certainly hurt the Union effort. But it certainly would have deprived us if, if he were not general throughout the tenure. He probably wouldn't have been president and certainly would have deprived us of a first president, maybe a president of the Constitutional Convention. And and everything else goes from there. So what So what a role Henry played in that. Well, you're catching me in part of my new daily routine, and that is having some AG1 from Athletic Greens. They give this nice bottle. I'm not a nutritional expert. That's why I need help from others, and Athletic Greens are the experts in providing what you could consider a nutritional insurance. That means you're going to have your diet. You still got to eat your meals. That's not what AG1 is. AG1 is on top of that. I really have no time to think about this stuff between having a full-time job and a, a podcast, as you know. I don't know which pills or vitamins are the right ones to take. You know, I think we have a bottle of vitamin D in the cabinet, and we try to take it when we can, particularly in the winter. This is so much more. This is 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source, superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens. Take it every day in the morning, cold water in one scoop of AG1. Keto, paleo, vegan, dairy-free, gluten-free. Are you on a particular type of diet? I'm not, but it works with all those diets. It contains less than one gram of sugar, no GMOs, no nasty chemicals. Cost you less than $3 a day. This is the great part of the offer. Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D, and five free travel packs with your first purchase. That way, if you're on the road, you don't have to worry about bringing the powder with you. You have it in these packs. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash M-Y-H-I-S-T slash MyHist. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash MyHist to take ownership of your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Hey, so I want to talk about a new podcast from the National World War II Museum. You know me, I love history. You like listening to this podcast. You like historical podcasts. You want to hear about history. World War II does come up in some of our discussions, but you know that the National World War II Museum can get into much more detail than I can. That's why I want to talk about their podcast. World War II on Topic is the newest podcast from the National World War II Museum. The museum's historians and experts are constantly producing best-in-their-field content on a variety of World War II topics, from webinars, lectures, roundtable discussions, and meet-the-author events. The National World War II Museum continues to provide a global audience with engaging ways to connect with this vital history. But it's a lot. 
and keeping up with the latest World War II research isn't everyone's full-time job. That's why they've developed the new World War II On Topic podcast. Highlighting some of the museum's best content, World War II On Topic airs weekly and allows you to experience a curated selection of World War II topics in an easily digestible format. Get acquainted with the National World War II Museum. Catch up on great content that you might have missed or rediscover your favorite lectures and events with World War II On Topic. Streaming now from the National World War II Museum. Listen to World War II On Topic on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcasting platform. Yeah, and I I think, you know, military historians recognize that uh, Washington was playing a long game Mm. uh, and basically recognized that he had to to keep his army in the field without losing. (laughs) Um, and uh, uh, un- un- until such time as the as the British f- finally had had enough, and uh, and of course uh, that's 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 what he did over a sustained period of time. And there are always, uh, I suppose, the people who want you know who are impatient and want it uh, want want something uh, ended with one decisive swoop. Yeah, Washington was playing the longer game, and and then as as many people have have pointed out, what what made Washington extraordinary in world history uh, is that after successfully um, leading the army uh, to to victory in the American Revolution, he stepped down and went home as as a private citizen um, rather than. Uh, seizing power, as you know, as as had been the history of of so many other other places in other times, uh, going back to the Greeks and the Romans. Uh, that's not to say he didn't involve himself in and you know continuing to want to make sure that the that the revolution um, um, was successful. But uh, but but uh, but he was prepared to uh, uh, step down from. From military and to uh, decline, um, you know, political office until such time as uh, he was basically called back to, pres- as you as you said, to to preside over the writing of the new constitution, and then um, it was pretty well uh, de- agreed upon by everyone that uh, that he was the only figure who could possibly um, um, serve as the first president, and uh, perhaps Patrick Henry could have been the second one, as you referenced earlier. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's, that's an interesting wrinkle that uh, uh, that that uh, was you know is, is is skipped over, I guess. Henry basically by 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 1796, which is when Washington announces that uh, two terms is enough, and uh, uh, and and so the uh, the election of of 1796 ends up with uh, John Adams as as president and Thomas Jefferson as as vice president. Um, Henry was uh, was much talked about as a uh, as, as a as a regional candidate and and for that matter um, you know one of the one of the names that people um, did recognize uh, in in all of the in all of the states rather than just uh, you know knowing knowing their local uh, uh, their local dignitaries and eminencies but uh, uh, Henry was talked about as a as, as a possible candidate for president at that time. Uh, the uh, electoral college w- rules were different than they are today, uh, in that the um, whoever got the first, the, the highest number of votes would become president, and the second highest number of votes became vice president, which is what happened with with uh, Adams and uh, and Jefferson. Although by the 1790s, of course, America was going toward a a, uh, a system of political parties that the uh, that the founders in Philadelphia. Uh, did not foresee and uh, and probably were disdainful toward, but uh, and and Henry certainly did. Basically, when he got word that people were thinking about him as a presidential candidate, by this time he's not in good health, and uh, has already declined um, all kinds of offers of federal appointment. Um, you know, the, the Supreme Court and ambassadorships and this and that and the other that uh, that Washington offered to him, but he's not in good health, and he basically. Publishes a letter that gets reprinted uh, through throughout the uh, up and down the East Coast, um, basically saying, I, you know, I I don't want to be a candidate for president because uh, he did not want to play the role of uh, you know a spoiler, uh, uh, you know, a, a Ross Perot, if you will. 
A reminder that I'm talking to John Kukla. His book is Patrick Henry, Champion of Liberty. Patrick Henry is a very comes off as a very empathetic, very nuanced person, a person that was a good executive, could read situations well and make a good decision. He knew how people would think. He knew when he had the people behind him. I wish you would talk a bit about how that comes into play with the issue of slavery. He wasn't totally opposed to some kind of solution in terms of slavery or ideas that might even be advanced or liberal for his time and his place in Virginia, but he certainly wasn't an abolitionist. Correct. One of the things that I'm proud about having accomplished in this book uh, is uh, fleshing out a clearer picture of Henry's attitudes towards slavery over the course of his uh, over the course of his life, and uh, I was I had the good fortune to uh, uh, to find some um, uh, some documentation of his interaction with uh, uh, with a number of Quakers who were uh, who were seeking um, to uh, uh, fight against slavery. Uh, over the course of uh, 30 years, the many of many of them are at in the Quaker archives at uh, at Haverford College outside outside uh, Philadelphia. But Henry Henry began. We don't we don't have any written um, commentary on slavery from Henry until the late 1760s, by which time he's already in his 30s and active in politics. So we don't we don't have boyhood musings, and and partially that's because um, the, the the family records, the family papers, uh, probably burned in a mansion fire in, uh, in 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 early in the 20th century. But but Henry, uh, what 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 we do know is what Samuel Davies, that influential evangelical, and his and Henry's uncle, uh, who was uh, an Anglican minister, we, we we do know very clearly what. What they were saying about slavery in at the time of Henry's youth, and it would have been typical for most Virginians, which is basically that slavery was uh, was the, the, nothing nothing sort of nothing wrong with it. Gosh, it's in the Bible, uh, but it was the responsibility of slaveholders by by this view, uh, basically to treat their slaves well, uh, teach them to read, so, and and bring them to Christianity. Um, so if that's the perspective that uh, you know is prevailing in Virginia in the 1730s and 40s when Henry's a young man what becomes interesting by the 1770s um, is the uh, is the fact that by that time Henry has decided that slavery is a is a bad thing in general for the state and more particularly um, in uh, in 1773 in an exchange of correspondence that was uh, that that was well known and and has been well known for 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 years. Um, Henry declares that slavery um, is evil, that it is a uh, that it is a sin, that the that there's no legal or moral uh, or even religious justification for slavery, that it is wrong. Um, and yet, in in a letter that I regard as uh, uh, as admirable, not necessarily for all of its sentiments, but certainly for its Candor, um, Henry refers to the fact that he ha- that he not only owns slaves, but they are slaves of my own purchase. In other words, um, unlike some of the Tidewater aristocrats who could say, you know, gosh, our families had slaves for four generations. What would Henry saying? I am complicit in slavery. I have purchased slaves, um, and yet it is wrong. It can't be defended on any moral or legal grounds. It's just. It's this just the, the the way things work here um, in this fallen world. Um, he continues to hold that perspective um, up until uh, the the last sentiments that we know as his in the 1790s when he's basically retiring from politics. By this time, his position is slavery is wrong. It is uh, it is repugnant. It's something that the uh, that the North as they as we enter into a stronger government and start arguing over how to how to pass taxes and stuff, it's something that the North will naturally come to oppose and to attack uh, because it's so repugnant. It's evil. It's nasty. It's awful, um, and 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 therefore it's going to become under attack. And yet, you know, what can what can we do about it? He did not participate in the 
belief that colonization, um, you know, that that uh, the establishment of what becomes the establishment of Liberia and and transporting um, um, African Americans back to uh, back to the African continent, that he he didn't see that as something that was uh, at all workable. Um, and so ultimately, he comes to the position that so many tragically that so many um, um, southern Southerners did in the 18th century, which is basically, um, it's, it's wrong. Um, I don't know how to get rid of it. So what we can do is, is treat them well, <laughs> teach them to read and bring them to Christianity. One of the things that he seemed to be uh, very much for is when Virginia attempted to put a ban on, say, an absolute ban on even freeing a slave. If a, if a master wanted to uh, free a slave at the end of their life or when, when the state of Virginia interceded in some cases or attempted to, to ban that, it seemed like at several, sometimes at the insistence of of his, the Quakers that he met with, or just on his own, he would oppose those efforts. In other words, at least preserving the avenue that uh, some s- slaves could be freed. Absolutely, and 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 he was he was in support of the uh, he he gave some legal counsel to this uh, Quaker Robert Pleasance, who uh, who who made an early ex- uh, experiment at um, freeing the slaves that that Pleasant owned. He 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 wanted to free them and let them give them land and see if they could. Uh, you know, make it make it as independent, small independent farmers. Um, and Henry seems to have been involved in in uh, giving Pleasant's legal advice on on that sort of thing. I I like to point out that you know, for all the the the, the well, I don't know if I don't I like to point out one one must I think you know dealing with with uh, with 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 the horrors of slavery. Um, I think I think one must recognize on the part of the revolutionary generation that although they did not deal with slavery as effectively as we might wish um, nevertheless we look to them for having basically declared that it is wrong um, and there's a sense in which uh, unlike for example in the uh, uh, in the years leading up to the Civil War when there was an argument put forward by a number of southerners that slavery was somehow a positive good the revolutionary generation had no illusions about that. Slavery is an evil, wrongful thing, um, and in that sense, they're setting the the moral standard by which we judge their failure to do anything. With the fifteenth pick, the Milwaukee Bucks select. You know their name, Giannis Adetokounmpo. Now discover their journey. Papa always talks about opportunity. What if this is it? Based on the true story. Give it. Oh. Of a family who risked everything. I can get you all sent back home. To rise together. Show them who we are. I will rise. Disney's Rise. Rated PG. Parental guidance suggested. Now streaming on Disney+. Plus. I think that's an interesting point, an important one to make. It's so often brought up that there's this great contradiction between the statements made by the revolutionaries and uh, liberty or death or uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and the practice of slavery, but they weren't unaware of that contradiction in right. a lot of cases. They could have been braver, certainly. They they deserve criticism from moderns, but of course we are moderns, and we're in our situation, so that criticism has to be limited by that, that, that fact. It's inescapable. While they certainly failed to exercise... Or, or or even even get something going where there might have been a, a pace out of um, or phase out of, right, of slavery right. and and I think what you were pointing out in terms of like uh, issues of manumission the, mm-hmm. the, the 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 right of a slaveholder to um, to to free his own slaves um, um, that that's that's one of the accomplishments that uh, Henry was certainly in agreement with and and in and in fairness to the 18th century Virginians at least, um, they were uh, they were adamant in closing off the slave trade, the uh, the importation of of, uh, of 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 more enslaved persons into into North America. Although you know um, there there are some cynics who would say whether well, you know there were there were there were already uh, a, a sufficient labor force in uh, in Virginia and Maryland uh, as opposed to uh, the Carolinas, for example, that were adamant in the. Uh, in, in, in extending the slave trade for at least 20 years. Yeah, it's certainly a tough issue. Uh, you, one tends to think that perhaps, or hopes that perhaps, uh, ending the slave trade plus manumission plus some 
colonization, perhaps all of these, uh, some compensation, all of right. these measures, uh, if the revolutionary generation's mindset had continued, might have led to a better outcome. But later, with the new attitude and the new generations and the expansion of, of slavery, that uh, that yeah. unfortunately those ideals didn't didn't persist. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think it's. I, th- I think one of the things that that, that this kind of discussion um, should inspire in a thoughtful, um, you know, reader or or or, or citizen is uh, is is a is a recognition that uh, that 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 the revolutionary generations uh, faced some intractable problems and uh, and and didn't didn't solve them um, uh, and failed. Uh, but but I, you know that that's a that's a fair judgment. But uh, when we look at ourselves, um, there are plenty of plenty of things uh, that uh, where 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 we too fall short in uh, uh, you know in, in in doing what we what we may know is right or think is right. I think that's a it's an excellent observation. They, these were mortal people uh, with political problems, very complex political problems. One of the big debates, of course, was the Constitution. Mm-hmm. Patrick Henry figures in to that he was adamantly opposed to the constitution Mm -hmm. uh he opposes it at the virginia ratifying convention and i guess uh, talk you could talk a bit about that and then also is is that the reason perhaps that he's not well known in history do we kind of black out the the people who oppose the constitution i think there is a bit of a tendency to celebrate uh uh, the, the the advocates of the Constitution in in Henry's case, uh, however, I think one of the things that separates him from the prominent Virginians that uh, that we do remember uh, is the fact that aside from two years in the Continental Congress in the first and second Continental Congress uh, in, the, in the years right before independence, um, Henry never held uh, national office. He was always uh, in, in in state office. Um, and uh, and and as a result, um, I suppose, in the same way that, uh, well, let's say that that if John Hancock hadn't had a distinctive signature, uh, we might mm-hmm. not remember him as prominently because he didn't go on to, you know, to become a president or a major senator or something like that under the under the under the the government that uh, you know the the, the, the present constitution. Um, but yeah, he was uh, he was he was absolutely uh, um, adamant in wanting um, modifications, amendments uh, made to to alter the what he found was the problems of the Constitution as it had been written in Philadelphia. And in the background of that, and I tell this story in the book, we don't have to go into it now. But but in the background of that, there were events going on in the in the seventeen uh, in the seventeen eighty five and six where. Uh, Congress was contemplating, um, uh, in, in terms of, in, in the context of negotiating a, a, a trade treaty with uh, with Spain, Congress was uh, some some congressmen were were contemplating uh, surrendering the uh, use or the right to navigate the Mississippi River, and Henry saw that as being a kind of a, a sectional conflict um, and a betrayal uh, that caused him to be a great deal more suspicious. In 1780s, you know, two 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 years later, um, when the Constitution was written and ratified, he was a good deal more suspicious about um, the uh, possible uh, antipathy of uh, Northern interests as opposed to what he saw as Virginia's um, best interests. And yet, uh, later in his life, uh, the, the kind of last chapter. Mm-hmm. We think, uh, you know, we, we've we've now set up Patrick Henry as opposed to the Constitution, and perhaps that means uh, opposed to the Federalist Party and with kind of the Jeffersonian Republicans. But yet, when Washington calls on him and asks him to run for uh, c- Congress, I believe uh, he runs with a special message that perhaps could be a message for for all of us yes. that this party system is wrong. And you have to unite. And he actually comes out and runs as, if not a, a proclaimed Federalist, at least a supporter 
of the party that's in government, uh, of the government, and against the kind of Jeffersonian Republicans and, and Madison and, and that lot. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a terribly uh, vituperative and uh, divisive time, the 1780s in general, in, in, in American politics. And, and it's, it's in that context. Uh, it's made worth by, by world events because, of course, uh, England and France are are uh, uh and their allies are all engaged in the um in in the wars of the uh of the of the French revolutionary era so so it, 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 in terms of the um kind of uh what uh, a climate of opinion it's almost like uh what we experienced in the first half of the 20th century with the cold war that kind of you know that kind of uh just divisive uh uh, world situation and then some device politics at home and and um, H- Henry uh, like Washington basically didn't uh, uh, didn't ever warm to the idea of uh, of political parties um, and so when when the parties were uh, were hammering at one another he saw that as uh, as be- as being something that could be uh, could could be very damaging and when Washington asked him to basically uh, run run for office as a moderate um, that was something that he that was the only person in the world that could have called Henry back into politics and and basically he that's that's what he spoke for at at the last uh, uh, the last election where he made a made a speech uh, uh, in at, at Charlotte Courthouse um, calling for unity and warning that uh, as, as somebody as he as he put it in the accounts that we have of that speech um, you know if 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 people want to overthrow the government uh, first they should try to change things by constitutional ways, um, you know, but play by the rules first, because as he saw it, um, the risk of overthrowing the government was that you would end up with either anarchy or, or tyranny. Um, in, in, in many respects, of course, this is exactly what happens a few years later when, uh, when Napoleon declares himself an emperor. I think it's just uh, if there was a movie to be made of, of, of Patrick Henry, a significant movie, it just makes that speech at the courthouse just makes for a, a, a good final scene, I think, because uh, after his message, that's his last couple of months there. Yeah, and, and that's, that's, act, uh, that's characteristic of, uh, of a, a good deal of his career. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a moment at the end of the ratifying convention in, in Virginia in 1788 where Henry, Henry is lost by 10 votes and Virginia has ratified, mm-hmm. and a bunch of disgruntled anti-federalists get together to basically uh, protest, and Henry is called to, to meet with them, and he says, gentlemen, we have made our case in the constitutional way in the, in the forum in which uh, we, we, we should. We have made our case. We have lost. It's time for us to go home. And that's uh, an important moment for the the the, the confidence uh, that would be in the Constitution. Yeah, it it really does uh, uh, seem like America has has in a sense lost the at least a full picture of a founder and uh, one that's probably closer to that word than than many others. Um, and by Doing that, of course, this is my history can beat up your politics. We're always looking at the impact of history of politics of today. It just seems like we've lost a a potential model maybe for so many things. Uh, the proper role of of government um, on 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 one side of the debate, but maybe perhaps right in the middle, and also issues like education and uh, uh, voting rights and so many other issues that uh, perhaps we, we've lost a model. And um, perhaps this book, which is John Kukla's Patrick Henry, Champion of Liberty, will, will set the record straight. Hope so. Uh, John, thanks for coming on My History Can Beat Up Your Politics. Absolutely. This was fun. I want to thank John Kukla for coming on the program. And keep in mind that you can support the program by subscribing to the premium podcast at www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpoliticspremium.com. You'll get bonus episodes. In the last episode, we talked a lot about Andrew Johnson's impeachment and didn't get time to delve into some characters. D.R. Anthony, the firebrand, abolitionist and newspaper publisher, Samuel Pomeroy. The senator who chided Edmund Ross for being corrupt, but may have been just as corrupt as he. And going back in the time machine, Luther Martin, the lawyer for Samuel Chase, who also attended the Constitutional Convention and had some criticisms of the impeachment clause that are interesting to hear given the two centuries of history. 
So we look at all of that in leftovers from the impeachment podcast, available on the premium podcast at www.myhistorycanbeatabeerpoliticspremium.com, including more about the story of Andrew Johnson's impeachment. www.myhistorycanbeatabeerpoliticspremium.com. It's not too late to get $25 off with your first purchase with our sponsor, Bombfell, unique styling service for men. B O M B F E L L dot com slash my history. Thanks for listening.